But uh, I, I want to dive right in today and, and get going here. We've, we spent the last four weeks looking at Haggai, an Old Testament prophet. And for the next four weeks, we're going to kind of, well, five weeks, because I guess we've got vacation Bible school next Sunday. Um, but for the next five weeks, four weeks of sermons, we are going to be looking at just some, some dilemmas, some questions, some things that I experience, and I don't know if you do, but I certainly experience pushback from, from friends, from relatives, from people I don't even know sometimes, of, of things that have caused crises of faith and, and things like that. We were, we were talking about this in Bible study the other day, and, and, and I have found so frequently in my life, in my ministry, and I was even part of this myself before I was a believer, that, that we often have a misconception of who God is. And, and we say, or people say, they don't believe in God because of that misconception of who God is. And they're actually reacting against something or someone that God actually never was, is, or will be. And so they, 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 they have this image of God in their mind that's not actually the God of the Bible, the God that we worship. And, and they, they rebel against that image when that's not actually who God even is. And so they create these false barriers by not understanding uh, of who God is. And, and so you, you run into this, or at least, again, like I do as a pastor, I bump into this with some regularity where, where people are kind of like, I want to believe in God, but... And then whatever it is kind of comes out. And, and, and I've noticed this, this recurring trend, theme, whatever you want to call it, this <coughs> mindset of this is increasing in our culture. More and more people kind of have this resistance to faith, but as you dig in with them, you find out they're resisting against something that's not actually there. And so that's why I want to talk about these subjects and, and dig into these. Maybe, maybe some of them will be true for you, and, and I want to take these hurdles away. I want to take down, you know, break through these ceilings, break down these barriers, break through these walls that keeps us from believing and trusting God. And, uh, because there are so many people that just say, yeah, no way, Pastor. Uh, no way. I, I can't even believe in that. Or, or some will just go so far as say, I don't even think God exists, which is a different sermon and an interesting dilemma of, of, of understanding. If you understand logic to say God doesn't exist is a statement from the perspective of a God. How can you know all things to say that God doesn't exist without being God yourself? But nonetheless, we don't want to get too far off on that track. But th there's people who struggle with this. I know there are. And uh, even those who've grown up in the church at times struggle with this. And it can come sometimes from a crisis of faith, right? Where something happened. Ooh. Sorry, I don't know if I did that. Or something happened, or, or someone did something, you were hurt, you were disappointed. And then you get to that point where you say, I want to believe, but I just can't. And, and so many people that live in that zone aren't rejecting the true God, as I said. And so I want to get over that. I want to help us through that. And we're going to look at who God actually is, the God of the Bible, instead of rejecting what I would call a, a distorted view of God. And, and rejecting this distorted view of God can really put you on the wrong track. And I want to make sure we overcome that. Well, how many of you remember back years and years ago now at this point, um, Back when they used to schedule TV shows, they would schedule in pairs. You remember this, okay? They, they would schedule popular shows one after the other because they wanted you to watch the first one and keep you around for the second one is how they used to do it. They do this still somewhat with popular shows. They'll have a really popular show and then they'll introduce a new show after it. So like American Idol will be here and then they'll put something they're trying to get you to start watching right after it. But it used to be they would put kind of two hits back to back, right? How many, how many of you remember, like, the love boat, something exciting and new, right? So you had the love boat, and then the plane, the plane, right? Fantasy Island. Anybody else remember those? I remember them, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like peanut butter and jelly putting those two shows together. Or, or Happy Days in Laverne and Shirley, if you're of that generation, right? You remember that? Or, or man, two shows that were just destined to be together. The six billion dollar man and the bionic woman, right? You got Lee Majors and Lindsay Wagner. Oh, that was awesome. That was TV greatness, right? If you remember those days. The, the effects weren't the best compared to modern shows, but hey, it was what we had. And if you watch those shows, you know that you had to be literally 
sitting there in front of your TV at the very exact right time on the exact right day every single week if you wanted to see that show. You see, younger people don't understand this concept, right? <laughs> see, we had, when I was a kid, four stations. Right? Some of you didn't even have that many. But we had four stations, and when you wanted to change them, you got up and you walked over and you turned a knob. Click, click, click. Right? And, and sometimes you even adjusted, like, you had the, the one that was the coat hanger kind of circle. You'd do that one a little bit for UHF, and VHF was the, well, these ones, right? And you'd make sure it would not be so fuzzy so I could watch Popeye or whatever it was I happened to be watching that day. And, and, and that's what you did. And you had to sit there through the commercials. There was no skip button on your remote. There was no remote. There was no shortcuts. You watched it all. Obviously, though, we, we live in a different world today, right? Nowadays, of course, you can binge watch entire TV series over a weekend. You can, you can queue up your Netflix, your Hulu, your Amazon Prime. Uh, you've got a DVR to record things when you're not there to even watch the show. Or, this is even better, you're already watching a good show and you can record another good show that's on at the exact same time. Right? So you don't have to miss out. In fact, if you've got a nice DVR, it'll record two shows at once while you're watching a third. So I can, I can see every single football game all, all, all weekend long if I want. Right? You don't have to miss out. Now, that, that used to be impossible. You had to pick one or the other. Now, now you can have it however you want it, whenever you want it. On-demand TV, so you can you miss the show, you can go on and it'll, it'll start playing. If you missed your favorite, you know, if you missed Chip and Joanna this week, you can go on Home and Garden TV and there they'll be, right? You, you can pull them up on your iPad. You can watch them anywhere in the world. And, and what this has created is, is an on-demand generation. And, and here's my thoughts on that. Because everything we want now is, is mostly on-demand, right? Anything I want, I can get on Amazon, and at the very most, in about two days, it will be at my front door. I don't have to wait for it. It will come to me. And because of that, and things like TV, and fast food, and microwaves, and all these kinds of things, because of this... I believe many people kind of want God to be the same way. They want to have an on-demand God. You know, I prayed about it, Pastor, and God didn't do it. God didn't do it, and therefore, I don't believe in God anymore because He didn't do it when I asked Him for it. God should do exactly what I want. An on-demand God is great until that on-demand God doesn't do what you demanded of Him to do. Maybe this is your story. Maybe you were a, a teenager just, just praying and begging for God to save your parents' marriage and you believed that He would, but then it didn't happen. And you're like, where, 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 where are you and where were you, God? Maybe you're a, a person, you're, you're maybe a very giving person and, and you've given and served and loved and doing these good works and and on and on, but yet you still are struggling to make ends meet financially. You're like, what's up with that God? Maybe you're the one who just, you prayed and you prayed and you prayed for somebody, right? Believing that God would heal them, or maybe that God would bring them back, but they never turned around, or they never were healed. God, I prayed it. Why, well, why not? Those were good things to pray for. I mean, you were, you were happily married and, and, and your dream was to have kids and all the people around you in your age group were having kids and you weren't, right? And you prayed about it, but you never got pregnant. God, where are you in this? And, and so often, when God doesn't do what we think that He should do, what we know that He can do, a lot of people, they get frustrated. They, they decide that... God either must not be real, or isn't powerful, or isn't good, or, or frankly, maybe just God doesn't care. Where is my on-demand God? Well, the answer is that the on-demand God doesn't exist. Let me say that again. On-demand God does not exist. A very common thought that I hear over and over and over again in conversations with people that I have 
as pastor, and, and a lot of this happens, you know, I see a lot of this on Facebook with friends, and I'll get messages, I get messages from old high school pals and people who are just struggling with things, and they'll be like, Pastor, I, I, I prayed, I prayed that God would take this depression from me, right, or whatever it is, and, and it didn't happen, and I, I'm losing my faith, I just can't believe in God, God couldn't want me to have this, could he? I mean, I want to believe in God, but yeah, my life is in shambles. And he didn't do exactly as I expected. So either he's not real, or he's not there, or he's not good, or he doesn't care. But folks, the on-demand God doesn't exist. And what we have to do is, we have to make sure that we understand where we fit in the narrative, in the, in the bigger picture of things, in the grand story of God, in the story of creation and eternity. And if you're taking notes, uh, I'm going to make it really super simple today. Uh, and the first little thing there, if you're taking notes, is God does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve Him. Okay? Let me say it again in case you didn't hear it the first time. God does not exist to do whatever it is that we want Him to do whenever we want Him to do it. God may answer our prayers. Yes, indeed. But His highest calling is not to do what we think He should do. God does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve Him. We have to recognize that if you're reading the Bible, we are not the main character, right? I'm not the main character of the Bible. God is the main character of the Bible. You see, God is not this celestial sugar daddy who, who gives us whatever we want. He's not this cosmic genie in the sky that if we rub his lamp a couple of times, he'll grant us our wishes. That's not who God is. He's not this cosmic Coke machine, and if you put enough quarters in and you push the right button, out will come our dreams. Out will come our answered prayer. No, God is the creator. We are the created. God is the potter. We are the clay in which he forms. He is the Lord of all, and we are His humble servants. And we need to understand that on-demand God simply doesn't exist. He does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve Him. Now that we've established that, well, some of you might say, then, well, well, then what is God's role? Who is He? I mean, what does He do exactly in my life? I mean... Who is this God if He's not exactly who I want Him to be? And what I want to do is kind of unpack who He is and get to know Him a little bit better and recognize who He is not as well. And again, I believe with, with all my heart that there are people all over the world today who are not rejecting who God really is. They're rejecting a distorted view, an inaccurate view of God. The on-demand to God. He doesn't exist. And I want to talk about three different qualities today. Three different qualities of the heart of God. Because if God is not an on-demand God, then who is He? Well, the, the next notes, if you're taking notes, the first one there is, and I hope you'll understand this, and hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll minister to you, is we need to recognize that God's heart is always loving. God's heart is always, always loving. For example... Those of you who are parents, and that's a lot of us in this room today, or maybe grandparents or great-grandparents, let me tell you two things that I know about you as a parent. Number one, there's never a time where you don't love your kids, right? doesn't matter what they do, how bad they've been, what knuckle-headed thing they might have done, you still love them, right? I mean, there might be times you don't like them. We'll be honest, that, that may be true. There may be times where you want to knock them into the middle of the next week, but you love them, so you won't. But you love them. You always love them. And the second thing I know is that there are times when you as parents do not do what they wanted you to do, even though you had the power to do it. Right? Right? There's times you don't do exactly what your kid asks, even though you could. You don't. You love them, 
Absolutely, you love them. But you do not do what they want, even if you have the power to do so. And we need to understand that God doesn't do exactly what we want, even if we know that He could. Even if we believe that He should. It doesn't mean that He doesn't love us when He doesn't do it when we want Him to. God is always loving. He always has our best interest at heart, even when we don't understand that. In fact, Romans 8.35, you'll know this. It says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, the love of God? Who shall separate us? Shall trouble? Shall, shall hardship? Shall persecution? Or how about famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Let me update this a little bit. Who shall separate you? Who shall separate you from the love of Christ? Financial troubles? Should relational breakdowns? How about unemployment? Cancer? Depression? We can answer it all in this way in verse 37. The Apostle Paul says, No. In all things and in everything that you can think of, we are more than conquerors. Through what? Through our own power? No. Through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, God's heart is always loving. And we need to understand that that God doesn't prove His love when He answers our prayers. God proved His love when He sent His Son Jesus to die on a cross for us. Let me say it again. He doesn't prove His love when He does what we want. God proves His love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you and for me. God's heart is always loving. There's never a time where God doesn't love you. But He will not always do what we want and think He should do. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors. Nothing could ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God's heart, always loving. The second big thought If He's not our on-demand God, who is He? I mean, His heart is always loving. But second, we need to understand that God's ways are higher than our ways. His ways are always higher than our ways. That's your second note there. I need to just kind of unpack this for a moment because as a pastor, there's so many times where, where somebody will say, why did this happen, right? Explain that to me. And that's a very difficult question as a pastor. There's a lot of difficult questions that come my way. When somebody says, Pastor, why did this happen? Why did 9-11 happen? Why did my child, why did my mom, why did this happen? I don't fake it when I'm a pastor here. I, I, never, I never try to make something up and never try to convince you of something I don't believe. I don't try to give you some explanation just to make you feel better about things. And there's so many different times where it would even be wrong or dangerous for me to try to explain what God was thinking. You see, when it comes to theology, there's many things that are basically above my pay grade where I do have to take faith in God over my wisdom and over my limited ability to understand. When a child is born with problems, when Why did that have to happen? Uh, I don't necessarily have an explanation for it. When a national disaster occurs, a terrorist attack or or a tornado or, or whatever it might be, I mean, I understand the underlying issue is sin. I understand that the world is broken and it's going to be broken until Jesus comes again. But for this particular instance, I'm not exactly sure all the time why that had to happen. Why did that happen? Sometimes the answer is, I don't know. But there is a lot that we can know. And what I do know 
And what I, I will embrace is things like Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, where God says this. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. He says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And as I read those words and other words throughout Scripture, I can take comfort recognizing that God is wiser than I am. That God already knows tomorrow, even when I don't. You see, time doesn't hold God. He is, he is a sovereign God, and He is a good God, and He is working in all things to bring about good. And I, I believe to my core that, that God has the end in mind, and He's using things, even at times evil things. We see this throughout the Bible. Bad things God still can use for good. God has the end in mind. And I don't see it, but He does. And He is conforming me into the the image of His Son. He is making me into who He wants me to be. And my limited, finite mind cannot understand all of what's going on there. He is infinite and glorious in all of His ways. and I don't have what it takes to understand all of it. I know that. But I can trust that He is good. I can trust that His promises are true, even when I don't understand. In fact, I don't have to understand. I just have to be faithful. Trust His heart. He is infinite, glorious, and good. His ways are different than our ways. And oftentimes, you'll recognize, even when you don't understand it in the moment, years and years later, you might be able to look back. And I've seen this so many times in my life. I didn't understand, why was I going through this? And I look back, you know, hindsight's 20-20, right? You see with so much more clarity after you've gone through it. You look back and you go, oh, now I see, right? Boy, am I glad I didn't marry her. (laughs) Anybody else been there? Yeah. Amen? Can I get an amen? Right? Stuff like that. I thought she was the one. God saved me. And it's so true about so many other things. But here is the thing. Some of you are going through something probably right now. And you hate it. You hate it, you hate it, you hate it. You wish it wasn't that way. You don't understand why are we experiencing this. This hurts. Yes, let's be honest. It hurts. Life sometimes hurts. It does. And when you don't understand, know that God's ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts, higher than your thoughts. It can be, oh, you know, like I said, I thought she was the right one, but nope, I guess not. But here's how, how it works, right? That one that you thought was the one, that was an economy class boyfriend. God has a business class upgrade for you coming, right? You don't want to settle for economy class when you can be up front with the curtains closed. You ever been up in that area, that front of the airplane after they close the curtains? Only once in my life have I ever been upgraded. Oh, it was glorious. I don't fly in that area. But man, if I'm taking a long flight, I might pay extra for that stuff. They take good care of you. God's ways are higher, though. He has a plan, right? And here's what I learned. If if I've learned anything, I learned this in seminary, I've learned this in my life. When you're in trouble, when things are coming at you, just repeat Scripture. It sounds overly simple, but knowing the Bible and knowing Scripture and just going to it and repeating it, so helpful. And know that God's ways are are higher. Just knowing that God's ways are higher can give you encouragement in those moments where you just go, man, today's a tough day. You thought you were going to buy this house and it was the right house and it was perfect for your family, Mm -hmm. right? And you didn't get it. Then you find a better house later. Maybe it's not even a better house, just a different house. But maybe He put you in a house next door to the right neighbors. Or maybe... That was a nicer house, but you didn't know that wasn't a good neighborhood. Now, you don't struggle with that so much up here in Aiken. They're all about the same. 
But that's the way life works. And, and many times, we think we know where God is leading us. This is the story of my life. I, I, I think I know the path that God has laid before me. And I am marching on that path, right? And then what I think is a detour is actually God bringing me back to the path He wanted me on to begin with. That happened to you? It happens to me. I think I got the map. But no. God is the map maker and He has the plans that are far greater than what I will ever know. And when I get to that destination of that new path that He has me on, I find that I am more blessed and amazed by that blessing than I ever would have been had I followed that first path. That's the way God works. And here's what we have to understand. God is not an on-demand God. Whenever we want Him to do something, whatever we want, no. That's not the way God works. God doesn't exist for us. We exist to serve Him. And God is always, always loving. His heart is for us. His ways are higher than our ways. That third set of the notes there, which is your fourth line of notes actually, is something that I hope that you will embrace. You see, God, God's presence is always enough. Sometimes we struggle with that, but God's presence is enough. There comes a time. Uh, let me make you a promise. Maybe, maybe some of you are not a follower of Jesus. Maybe you're a new follower. or Maybe you're just not a deeply developed person of faith yet. And if you will go beyond complacent Christianity, you know, that kind of Christianity where you just, you're punching the time clock, right? I showed up for my hour on Sunday, it's good. Right? But if you will go beyond that, if you will take and make your faith your own, if you will truly pursue goodness, the goodness of God, if you will truly pursue Him, get to know God's character, if you get to know His nature, if you get to know who God is, I promise you that years and years from now, you will have the deepest assurances, that you will have abounding joy and peace. That only comes from knowing that God is enough. You will find that God will become your rock and your foundation in all things. That regardless of what may come in life, He will be there for you. Because God is with you. He is ever present and always there. See, I don't have... I don't think I'm doing anything here. I, I, sorry about this. It's just popping today. So I'm not touching anything, I promise. But uh, God is our rock and our foundation. And it makes us... Gives us stability when the world is in disorder. And I don't have to worry about what's going to happen to me because I know God goes there with me. That He never leaves me. That He'll never forsake me. And that nothing that I could ever experience is something that He's not ready to handle with me. And it's something that He hasn't already gone with before me. God is with me. This is the posture of an Old Testament guy you might have heard of. A guy who was king. A guy by the name of King David, right? This is the posture of King David way back talking about the intimacy that he had with his God when things didn't make sense. And for a moment you might think, oh yeah, King David, right? Everything was so easy for him. But everything wasn't easy for King David. He had a lot of challenges. King David cried out to God more than any three of us combined, I would bet. God, why are you allowing this? Why am I on the run, God? Why is my son trying to kill me, God? God, I, I've done everything right. This doesn't seem fair. Why are you letting your enemies do this to me? God, I've done it all right. See, David had a lot of dark valleys in his life more than we probably will ever know about. Yet, as he grew to know the faithfulness of God, here's what David had to say. You'll know this. Psalm 23. One of the greatest chapters in all of Scripture. 
David says, even though I walk through the valley, through this darkest of valleys, even though I walk through this dark valley or the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear any evil. Why? He said to God, because you are with me. Even though I, I walk through a place where I could die in a heartbeat, even though I walk through a place where there's no physical nourishment, where there's no protection, where there's robbers, robbers or bandits or, or warriors who are trying to take my life, even though I walk through these dark places, I don't have to be afraid, God. Why? Because you are with me. Because you are here. Your presence is enough. A story I don't share often. I mention it in passing, but I don't delve into it a whole lot in my life because it's part of my history, but it's just not something I like to dwell on a lot. I used to be a football player. You can tell, right? But what you can't tell is I used to be a running back. I played football in college, and I was a very gifted athlete. Um, I got into college on a very large football scholarship. I, I had the highest scholarship of anybody on our team. If you move your head forward, I think you'll quit doing that. Just push it. There. It yeah, like doesn't. Get down or something away from the, the way of the okay. Try that. All right, I'll try that. Uh, she's over there eyeballing to make sure. Thank you. She's good at what she does, so thank you, Ruth. Um, so, so I played football in college, and I, I grew up in, in a not, not a fluent family in any way. There's a lot of issues. My mother had a bunch of medical issues that left us with millions of dollars in medical bills. And long story I'm not going to get into, but I knew if I was going to college, I had to get good grades, and I had to be good at sports. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I worked at. And so I got a presidential honors scholarship, um, and then I got a really large football scholarship. I had the largest scholarship on my team for football, and that allowed me to go to college. And so went to the University of Sioux Falls back when it was called Sioux Falls College. Sioux Fu Koo, woohoo, right? Um, no, no, no cougars here, just me. Uh, I understand. But uh, uh, so I went and played football, and, and I was one of two freshmen who started. Um, usually in college football, a lot of places. If you're a freshman. They redshirt you, which means you don't get to play the first year. So then you come back a second year as a freshman, and you don't get to play that year either. Then your third year, you might get to play a little bit special teams. And then your fourth year, which is now your junior year as far as college football goes, your fourth year, then you might start playing. And then by your senior year, you're going to be good enough to be on the field all the time. That's the way college football works. But again, God, God made me strong. He made me fast. He made me good at football. And so... I went and played football. And this was before I was a Christian. I didn't become a Christian until I was in college. And so I went and played football, and, and I made these friends, and I had all this fun. I, got, I hung out with the right guys. You know, I, I was friends with the right guys on the football team. I got invited to all the right parties and all the right things, and had a good time. It was fun. I was living for myself. But slowly, through that first year of college, God was working in my heart in ways that I had no idea. And then come about uh, middle of January, my freshman year of college, I just reached a point where on the outside things looked good. But on the inside, I was a wreck. I was miserable. I just hated my life. I was unhappy. My relationships were broken. I wasn't a nice person. Truly, I wasn't a nice person. Coarse, crass, just obnoxious. And I was big enough, you couldn't do anything about it. It's the way it was. And yet, God worked in me. And so I have this, this transformation, and then I give my life over to Jesus, right? And for the, for the first few weeks, I was just on fire. And I had these guys who were shepherding me, and I was just in a great environment. And within six weeks of becoming a Christian, I was giving my testimony in Mexico on a missions trip. God used crazy things to get a hold of me. And then that summer, I got a job working at a high adventure base in New Mexico, a backpacking base for the Boy Scouts of America. And I went down there thinking, this is going to be fabulous training for me getting ready for football. I'm going to spend all summer hiking at about 10,000 feet in altitude. I'm going to come back just shredded, right? 
my lungs will be great, my oxygen will be awesome, I'm going to be just a rock star now on the football team. And about halfway through that summer, something just, you know, you know how that works, that like back the brain thing starts working on you, and you hear some noise in there, but you try to push it off, you don't want to think about that. But this voice keeps getting louder in my head, that I needed to quit playing football. That's crazy talk. Football is who I am. It's who I was created to be. But yet I had this nagging, slowly growing voice in my head that I need to quit playing football. I'm like, no, that's no, uh, that that can't possibly be. Throughout that summer, I'd be hiking through the woods. I'd be hiking by myself. Trees, mountains, deer, bears, mountain lions, all that kind of stuff. Lots of little chipmunks. And that voice kept getting louder and louder. This is a thought I would never have on my own, folks. It was telling me, you need to quit playing football. So I prayed about it and I wrestled with it. I went and sat with, the, with the, both the priest and the pastors who were working at the camp and said, Help me figure this out. I don't understand this. This doesn't make sense to me. And they just, you know, pray about it and listen to God. It's not what I want to hear, man. So I did. I kept listening, kept praying. And as the summer was winding to a close, I knew I had to, my coaches were waiting for me to come back. I had to get back to football camp, so I had to actually leave my job a couple of weeks early to get back to football camp. And that last week, I was just burning turmoil and finally alright God you win I'm not going to play football this year but I knew that wasn't the kind of thing that I could just call my coach on the phone and tell him so I had to drive from New Mexico to South Dakota I drove literally all day Saturday 24 hours almost straight to get back slept Sunday and was at my coach's office by 6.30 Monday morning because I knew he would get there early my coach was a man of the word Bob Young would sit there reading his Bible from 6.30 to 7.30. Practice started at 8. And so Bob would be in his office at 6.30. I went and knocked on his door, and he was kind of shocked that somebody would be there at 6.30 in the morning. And I kind of come in, Coach. He said, yeah, good to see you. I haven't seen you all summer. Yeah, yeah. Well, Coach, uh, it's good to see you, but I got some bad news. Well, what's that? I said, Coach, I'm not going to play this year. And what? <laughs> all right, what do you mean? You, you started last year. I said, no, I, I can't play football. And he looked at me like I'd lost my mind. I said, Coach, let me, let me tell you my story. So, told him all the stuff that I'd gone through. He didn't know I wasn't a Christian before. Told him, came to faith, and this is where God was leading me. He looked me in the eyes and he said, I, I can't argue with you. God is telling you, don't play. It's going to hurt us, but you have my blessing." but you can't keep your scholarship. So I gave up about $36,000 worth of scholarships over the next three years by quitting football. But that's what God wanted me to do. And I had to follow His leading, and I had to trust that in these valleys there was going to be a peak. That He knew where He was leading me, even though this was my identity, folks. This is who I am. And God was telling me, I have to give it up. But you see, what happened here was, and I didn't know this, football was so much of my identity, God couldn't really fully work through my life until I gave that up, until I surrendered it, because that was my idol. And when I finally gave that up, all of a sudden, God started opening up new opportunities. God started to work in me that, here I am, Lord. (laughs) I'm on a stage preaching to people. That was nothing that I ever dreamed would ever happen in my life. And it took God taking away the most important thing in my life to get me finally, fully to a place of surrender. When I felt like I had nothing left, nowhere to go, almost no idea of who I was, it was there that God met me most fully. It wasn't what I wanted. Uh Uh-uh. Not even close. I could not have ever imagined it. But that's how God works. It's not about me. 
God does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve Him. We exist to bring glory to Him. When you don't understand, trust God. So what you're saying, Pastor Chris, is like, you know, I know God's not always going to do what I want Him to do. I know God's not going to answer every prayer. But, but, no buts. Trust God. God is way too powerful. God is way too strong. God is way too sovereign and He's too good for me to even comprehend. God is the creator of all of the universe, the sustainer of all things. He is the one who knows the beginning to the end. And if He is that one, and He is, then we can trust Him even when we don't know where that path is leading. God is the one who created us with the purpose to draw us to Himself. That we exist to bring Him the glory. And when something doesn't go as planned, we are to trust that He is conforming us, that He is changing us, that He is drawing us, that He is indeed making us more like His Son, Jesus. And when you don't understand... God, why didn't you? Whatever. Remember that God on demand doesn't exist. If you're rejecting that God, if you're rejecting that false view of who God is, don't reject God, because that's not who God is. His heart is always loving. His ways are always higher. And no matter what it is that you are going through, even in this moment, God's presence, which is here now. His presence is always enough. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.